coming to the seminar. My name is Joseph Lee, and here's the agenda for this afternoon. So we'll have two speeches from our three doctors, and after each speech, there'll be a Q&A where the doctors will uh, answer your questions. But first, let me share my personal story as to why I organized this event. My first incident was in preschool after a nap. I stopped breathing. My teachers had no idea what was going on, so they called 911. Fortunately, I recovered after a few minutes. Unfortunately, that was the beginning of the numerous 911 calls made to save my life. That year, I was only four. After that, every few weeks, I passed out during my sleep or in the morning. My parents took me to see many doctors, but I was misdiagnosed and mistreated as having a case of mysterious epilepsy. My parents never stopped trying to find out what the real cause of my problem was. My mom watched me every night making sure I did not pass out. We finally went to see Dr. Coltine, the chief ENT doctor at Stanford's Children's Hospital. He diagnosed me as having children's sleep apnea. During my sleep test for the tonsillectomy operation, my blood oxygen level is 82% instead of the normal 98%. I was so oxygen deprived, it prevented me from having a normal development. I was also very, very lucky that Dr. Pauli provided special orthodontic treatment to open my airway when I was just nine. That procedure, however, only works before puberty. Each year, many kids are suffering from the same problems I did. Some are not as lucky as I was to get the treatment that I did. One girl, she was simply diagnosed as having ADHD. When she was 16, she fell asleep behind the wheel and crashed into a telephone pole. She almost lost her life. Only then, she was diagnosed as having sleep apnea. It was too late. She was too old to get the simple orthodontic treatment that I did. So she either had to go through painful surgery or wear a breathing apparatus for the rest of her life. Our family's painful journey and my several friends' experience expose one big problem. Few parents and not enough doctors know about this issue, and too few know about the comprehensive treatment. Today, you'll hear from the three doctors who treated me and gave me the opportunity to be healthy and happy. Thank you. So we'll begin with Dr. Poltai. Hi everybody, before I hook up my computer, I wanna say a few words of thank you and uh, tell you why I'm here and uh, but by myself. Um, you know, I'm 67 and I've uh, been in medicine for 40 years. And nothing, nothing is quite as thrilling as when I get an email from one of my past patients, sometimes a year later, sometimes five years later, sometimes even 25 years later, telling me, hey, Dr. K, you, you really helped me. And uh, that was the situation with Joseph. And uh, you know, uh, I couldn't help but say yes to come here and help tell his story a little bit. Anyway, I'm a kids EMT doc at, uh, at Stanford. I've uh, been in uh, medicine, as I said, uh, finished residency in 1980. I uh, most, spent most of my career in Albany at the Albany Medical College in upstate New York. Uh, started the program in children's EMT at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, back at the, before the turn of the millennium, and then came here to Stanford, was recruited here to Stanford when uh, the new department was formed in 2004. Uh, the, my interest has been uh, pediatric airway, pediatric trauma, head and neck surgery, and uh, somehow over the years I've become involved in uh, sleep apnea as well, and maybe that's a story I'd like to tell you today. So give me a moment, I will hook up my computer, 
and get this uh, thing going. And, uh, let's see where is the connection here. You can't. So, pediatric sleep apnea, it's a lot of things. And uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today in terms of sleep apnea is what I, what I take care of. And we'll have a very nice perspective from the guys who take care of the soft tissues of the head and neck, and then the gentlemen uh, who take care of the architecture, the underlying bony hardware, the hardware of the head and neck. Uh, the equation of children's sleep apnea is a complex one. Uh, it depends on the age of the child, the anatomy of the child, and the complex immune physiology and the functional physiology of how we swallow, how we talk, how we are as human beings. When I think about sleep apnea in kids, I think about a three-legged stool. It's based on, number one, the symptoms of the child. What are the problems that child's manifesting? Uh, number two, what is the anatomy of the child? And then the third piece is the sleep study itself, called the polysomnogram. What I've learned over the years is that there are some common patterns to sleep apnea in kids. Uh, now, this slide could have many, many more categories, but these are the two biggies. The first one is kids with big tonsils and adenoids. And then the second one is the kids who have more of an adult pattern where the craniofacial structures, the bony part of the face and the tongue somehow are out of proportion and uh, the getting in the way of, of the airway staying open during sleep. Now when I was a resident, this was sleep apnea surgery, grossly obese people who were dying because they could not breathe at night. But subsequently, uh, sleep apnea has become much more sophisticated, and part of that sophistication owes its uh, debt to uh, Dr. William DeMette, who started the first sleep clinic in the world here at Stanford back in the mid-70s. Uh, and uh, this uh, is part of my story because uh, of the rich resource for sleep studies that exist at the Stanford facility. Anyway, sleep apnea as a childhood illness, as a diagnosis, was accepted uh, into the uh, official uh, compendium of these things back in 1976, which was the year I started my ENT residency training. Um, we see about, it's, it seems to take, being in about one to three percent of kids, they say about 10 percent of kids will snore, so it's a small subset of the children who snore. It's not all kids who snore. Um, and there are three components, and this is important, uh, I'm going to emphasize this, is hypoxemia, is low oxygen, okay? The oxygen gets below a certain level. Hypercarbium, that's a fancy term for the carbon dioxide, like in the atmosphere going too high, the carbon dioxide level in the blood goes too high. And then the most important one is fragmentation of sleep. And the way I explain fragmentation of sleep to my parents is as follows. Somebody lives in your closet. You go to sleep, and that person comes out of your closet and puts your pillow on your face. You wake up. They go back into the closet. You will go back to sleep. A few minutes later, they come and put the pillow on your face. You wake up. At the end of the night, you're going to have woken up multiple times. Your sleep has been fragmented, broken up. How are you going to feel in the morning? Kind of lousy, okay? You do that night after night after night. Don't feel so good. So that's fragmentation. Now, what are the symptoms? And this is again from your perspective as parents and as uh, folks who are interested in sleep. I mean, what are the symptoms in children? Well, they're snoring, and this is probably the the real key kickoff. Very, it's unusual to see a child having sleep apnea who doesn't snore. 
Second one that we see is the restless sleeping. The children are all over the place in the bed. Look like they've had uh, two or three children have slept in that bed. Uh, they sometimes sweat and they break out in sweats. Uh, and uh, almost like uh, the ladies going through menopause. Um, there's the issue of daytime tiredness. I mentioned that if you don't, if you don't get a good night of sleep, you're going to be tired in the daytime. Um, and then long-term problems, we worry about a cardiovascular problems. One of the funny things, years ago, I read in an old book that they used to take out tonsils for children who wet the bed. I said, La I laughed about that, isn't that, aren't they crazy? And then about a year later, somebody came out with an article in one of our journals about noting the association between bedwetting and um, sleep apnea. So what we see is about half the kids who we take care of who have a symptom of bedwetting, uh, who we see for your sleep apnea, about half of them will get better, not all of them, but about half of them the sleep apnea, the, the, the bedwetting will diminish. And then there's finally the biggest questions I get asked by parents, how does this affect the child at school? We see a lot of kids who have hyperactivity uh, and who have uh, attention deficit issues and who have autism, who parents have questions about, do they have sleep apnea? My experience has been as follows. Number one is that often children will, with those symptoms have, with those diagnoses, autism, attention deficit, hyperactivity, will have sleep apnea, okay? But if they don't have the symptoms, they're not likely to have sleep apnea. In other words, if they're not snoring, it's not likely to have. So those kids we always get, sleep studies for to make sure that we're, the two might be related. The other thing that I find is often uh, that when we treat the kids who, who have sleep apnea and have these other diagnoses, often the sleep apnea gets much better, but the behavioral issues don't necessarily improve. It's hard to call it ahead of time. And this is a real disappointing fact that, that we can't tell parents ahead of time how much improvement they can expect. So, I talked a little bit about we get sleep studies for these kids. Well, what's a sleep study? And we call it a polysomnogram. Poly means many, somno means sleep, and gram means weight. So, we look at mul multiple factors. We look at uh, electroencephalogram to see what's the, the stage of sleep the child is in. We look at electrooculogram to see what's the eye movement doing, particularly important in REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. We look at muscle tone with an electromyogram. We look at an electrocardiogram for the heart rate. And then we look at the flow of, eye, of air through the nose. We use thermistors, but it's really an air meter right at your nose. And then the last thing is those of you who do a lot of exercising with uh, these chest uh, straps, it's a platysmograph, measures their chest expansion, see how much that's moving. So that's a polysomnogram. And what a polysomnogram uh, does for us, it tells us about oxygen. That's the last thing, we do oximetry as well. So we measure the oxygen level throughout. So we look at oxygen, sometimes we actually take blood, blood tests for hypercarbia, particularly if we're concerned about that and we see the fragmentation of the sleep. And these are the definitions of what sleep apnea we're we looking for. We want to look at pauses in breathing that are greater than second, 10 seconds associated with an arousal of fragmentation. We look at hypopnea as a partial obstruction where the airflow is decreased by about 30%. And then we look at oxygen levels Interesting about oxygen. Oxygen goes from 100% to about 92% very slowly. It's got a slow uh, tangent. But it gets to about 92 and it all of a sudden that it drops down very rapidly into the 70s, which is venous blood. So that once you hit, get off of that 92, below 92 level, you begin to get a little bit concerned about the kids because they can desaturate significantly. So those are the things that we're looking for. And then we put this all together into what we call an apnea hypopnea index, okay? And 
this is very complicated and we get together in conferences, we argue among each other what's important about this and what's important about that. But when all said and done, this is the definitions we've kind of come to a consensus to in kids, in kids. Apnea apopnea index in less than one in a child is normal. One to five is mild. Five to 10 is moderate. Uh, anything greater than 10 is considered severe. Keep in mind, in adults, zero to 10 is normal. Okay, and then it kind of complicates things when you've got a 14 or a 15 or 18 year old teenager. Um, so, um, the treatment of sleep, uh, sleep apnea has uh, been uh, uh, through an evolution since we've accepted the fact that kids have sleep apnea. The first use of CPAP when children was reported in 1984, so it's been uh, around for about, uh, I guess, 30 years. Um, but the issue of uh, using uh, of, of CPAP and surgery is you need to begin to think about the differences as the child grows. Um, the airway grows with the child, but it's not a linear relationship. The growth of the bone and the facial soft tissues are very re related. In other words, the, initially the bone is very soft and small, okay? Uh, the soft tissues are kind of thin and, uh, and not in the way of, of, of the airway. But as the things grow, things change in proportion. As you see in the growth of the child from uh, uh, England uh, as uh, they get bigger. Um, and then the other Im important on this thing to understand is that the anatomy and the immune physiology are codependent. And I'll explain that in, uh, in detail. And the other thing is that initially when we're born, all we do, what do we do? We, we have to breathe, we have to swallow, we have to poop and pee. Okay, as you grow, you have to learn how to chew, you have to learn how to swallow properly food, you have to learn how to speak. Okay, these are complex functions that your throat needs to learn how to do. Okay, and I'll show you why that's important in a moment. So, as I mentioned, there's clearly, clearly a fuzzy boundary between kids and adults. So, how does this affect the, the, the throat? Now, here we have the difference between an adult and a child. On the right side, you see the adult. The voice box is way down uh, in, the, in the neck. In the infant, the voice box is very high up, almost like in almost all other mammals. In other words, a child breathes through the nose, goes directly into the air, into the, into the voice, into the breathing passage, while the food goes around through the mouth to the food pipe. This changes as we grow and the voice box descends. The reason this is important is for you to understand what the voice box does and its role in speech, okay? When you take out a voice box out of a cadaver and you force air through it, what it sounds like is the mouthpiece of a saxophone. It takes the throat, the tongue, the resonating chambers of the face to give us the sounds of speech, much like the musical instrument we have in terms of the body of the saxophone. Okay? Now, the price we pay for that is that we have this elongated meat tube through which we both have to swallow and breathe. Swallowing and breathing are two functions that are totally have to be isolated, two vital functions. You can't do without breathing and you can't do without eating, but it, and they gotta go through the same real estate, but they gotta be completely separated. So how does that happen? Well, it's got really complicated, but as I say, it's a meat tube that all of this has to transpire through and it's got to move around a lot. Now, all of you, I want you to kind of swallow and put your hand on your voice box. Swallow your saliva. Feel that voice box moving up and down? Okay, that's all those muscles moving things around. 
And what's amazing is the amount of real estate up in your brain that's devoted to this process. Almost the biggest cranial nerve that you have is your vagus nerve. It's called the wanderer. It comes out of your brain, out of your brain stem, but it occupies a huge amount of space in your brain stem and it controls your swallowing and your breathing and facilitates the coordination with your breathing. To give you some idea of the amount of resource that's devoted to this, if you look at the number of nerve fibers going to say the calf muscle here, the gastroc muscle, it's about one to 2,000. We used to think that the most accurate muscles and most narrowly uh, controlled muscles by nerve were the eyes. But it turns out that the muscle nerve ratio in the throat is one to six. It's the richest in the body. Goes to highlight, again, how important this two processes of swallowing and breathing are. So let's complicate things now. Uh, the tonsils and the adenoids and the lingual tonsils, these are called the lymphoid structures in the throat, are begin to grow soon after infancy and proceed growing until the kids vary between six and ten. Um, and all of this takes place within this meat tube that I've just described to you that's got all of this amazing uh, innervation that allows it to do these two vital functions that have to be kept separate. So the parents always ask me, what, what's with this tonsil business? What do the tonsils do? And I tell them it's radar. If you look at the anatomy on the drawing I've made, what you see is that everything that you breathe and everything that you eat has to go through this circle of lymphoid tissue. Adenoids are up high in the back, tonsils are on either side in the middle, and on the back of your tongue, that bumpy stuff, if you ever look in somebody's mouth, those are your lingual tonsils. This is radar, and it communicates with the rest of the immune system what is gone by it. And again, it's a lymphoid circle through which everything needs to go. It's called Waldeyer's ring. Now, this complicates sleep problems because it's in the airway. So, as I said earlier, it's a complex equation. We have age, anatomy, physiology, immunology. How do we deconstruct it and begin to make sense of it to know what to do for the kids? Well, what we know is that there seems to be a pretty predictable trajectory for a lot of kids of the growth of tonsils and adenoids. So adenoids reach their peak. Ad, let me remind you, adenoids are in the back of the nose, up high in the back. Okay, these are the adenoids. Let's see if I can show you. These are the adenoids right there, okay? Those grow, reach, tend to reach maximum around three. These are the tonsils on either side, and these reach maximum around six. Uh, and then they, after a while, they begin to decrease in size. The adenoids uh, kind of hold a special location, um, and they're pr the problems they cause have been known for a hundred years. This is a photograph from a, one of my books uh, in my library from 1917 of a child with what was then called an adenoid facies. The face is elongated, the child has an open mouth posture, and the eyes are kind of hollow and the big circles under the eyes. Classic appearance. Um, this is, uh, we see this routinely in uh, very young kids, 18, 24 month olds, up to three years of age. And often the complaint is that, and we see this regularly, is nasal obstruction. The child's nose is always obstructed. Uh, they're always mouth breathing, they're snoring at night, they sleep restlessly, and because of the location of the adenoids in relationship to the ear eustachian tube, these kids also get ear infections. Let me give you an example. All of you, pinch your nose, close your mouths, now sniff in, okay? You feel it in your ear? Okay, do it, okay? That's the relation. The adenoids sit right where that opening occurs. If that opening is obstructed, uh, the kids end up with ear infections. Often the tonsils in these kids are small. 
we can get x-rays on them, and uh, here's uh, the uh, adenoids showing in the airway, and uh, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Sun will talk more about these type of x-rays. We can look inside the nose with our fiberscopes, and you can see this kind of like a Swedish meatball back here, completely blocking off the back end of the nose. Um, Historically, we used to kind of scrape these things out, and uh, years ago, back about 95, um, we developed this uh, curved microdegrader for uh, doing adenoidectomy, and I hope I don't offend uh, folks with this video of uh, adenoidectomy being done, but this shows the microdegrader reaching back with a dental mirror up into the back of the nose and uh, resecting the adenoid tissue that's obstructing the, uh, the space. This child will now be able to breathe properly through the nose, and uh, this is basic plumbing, okay? It's real simple stuff. It's not complicated. Technically, uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, as far as the tonsils are concerned, uh, it's been common knowledge going back again 150 years that tonsils sometimes cause problems with breathing. It's been known and tonsillectomy has been done by ENT surgeons going back 100 years for this problem, although we didn't call it sleep apnea. Uh, we just had the kid had trouble breathing, he's got big tonsils. We know that if we cut out part of the tonsil or all of the tonsils, that got better. Um, so. We developed, uh, starting in the 1930s, what was called the modern tonsillectomy, uh, removing the, all of the tonsil and nothing but the tonsil, and it was a satisfying, anatomically nice operation. There was a nice kind of cleavage plane between the tonsil and the muscles underneath it. Um, and it was a rational operation before you had antibiotics and problems with rheumatic heart disease. Um, and this was what a regular, old-fashioned steel tonsillectomy looks like. You can see the tonsil uh, tissue right here being removed. There we go. Let's see if I can find my hair. There we go. Right there. And it's going to be snared out. This is the way I learned uh, 40 years, 45 years ago when I first trained. And then we stopped the bleeding using a suction cautery. Um, and that's that. Now, these days we do tonsillectomy mostly in the United States using an electrocautery device. And you can see the, uh, the speed with which the surgery works. Uh, about, this is about a 90 second tonsillectomy. Uh, and this is low energy so that the tissues aren't burned. You can see there's no char, but there's also no bleeding. And uh, you don't need to. I hope this is of interest to folks, and uh, I'm always a little concerned showing videos of surgery, but I figured you'd uh, you'd enjoy. This is what the kids get when they get a total tonsillectomy. Um, uh, now, the problem with tonsillectomy is that there's about a seven to ten day period of recovery when you take out the entire tonsil. Um, and there seems to be a problem with an irreducible rate of bleeding in the best hands in the world, including mine. Uh, the rate of bleeding is about one to two percent. Uh, uh, so one or two kids out of 100 is going to have to go back to the operating room to stop bleeding, usually around day five, day six, day seven post-operatively. It's hardly ever on the day of surgery. It's usually after the scab comes off of the site of surgery. Now, there's been lots of strategies trying to deal with this, but none of this really worked. And basically, there's no such thing as a painless tonsillectomy that never bleeds. And this is a fundamental design flaw of the operation. It's the pain is you get from injury to the muscles that you dissected, that you remove the tonsil from. And those tonsils become, that muscle becomes inflamed. And you don't get the pain to go away until that area is healed over completely and you're vulnerable to bleeding uh, for that. So seeing uh, 20 years of the benefits of tonsillectomy, but having children suffer the pain of tonsillectomy, 
that gave me the thought of is there another way? And uh, we derived the general concept from uh, the partial tonsillectomy from a specific child. It was the 11-month-old son of one of my partners, one of my colleagues at the Albany Medical College. And um, the child had severe sleep apnea and huge, huge tonsils, but it was 11 months old. And I really did not want to do a tonsillectomy on this baby. I haven't had a year or so of experience using the microdebrider for the adenoidectomy. I said, you know, why don't we just take part of it out of the way and see how the child does? And that's what I did. The parents agreed, and we put the baby into the uh, into the ICU post op. I'm making rounds that evening, and kids eating mac and cheese. And, so, mm. um, and um, you got to understand. In the ENT, uh, the first thing you were taught when you were do a tonsillectomy, leave no tonsil behind, it'll grow back. So I was doing something that was a little bit out of the ordinary, and for the next few years I found a few other very young kids with a kind of similar situation, and the, the pattern consisted. And in about 2000, I finally I put the, the so work together in, uh, in 2001 published uh, our results and uh, showing that one is we don't get bleeding and the recovery is about half as long. Um, so we did a partial tonsillectomy and we kind of well, carefully between 96, 98, did 23 cases, again consistent reduced pain and rapid recovery. And this is what a partial tonsillectomy looks like using the microdebrider. You can see the tonsil essentially being chewed up by the microdebrider, which sucks in and cuts at the same time. It was originally developed for orthopedic surgery for doing shaving arthroscopic uh, cartilage out of the knee. Um, and uh, we just found it wonderfully useful in, in using the lymphoid tissues uh, in the head and neck area. So that's what a partial tonsillectomy looks like. Global recovery is much easier on the kids. This is out of a thousand kids. Uh, the the post-op bleeding dehydration rates are vastly different, but the quality of life is not. There are other tools we can do the same thing with. Uh, this is a radio frequency device. Does uh, also does the uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, bottom line is that the partial tonsillectomy technique is now part of our menu for doing um, uh, the for managing sleep apnea in certain children. Question is, are they equivalent? And the answer is yes and maybe. Um, <clears throat> we just finished a retrospective study of 455 kids who had the partial, comparing them to almost 1,200 kids or 1,100 kids who had the total. And again, what we see is uh, the improvement in the sleep is the same, and uh, the uh, improvement in the oxygen saturation is the same. Uh, we see about a 2% regrowth rate versus 3% hemorrhage rate. So again, when do you want your complication, early or late? Uh, do you want elective or do you want it emergent? And uh, that's the decision I give to parents uh, when I see uh, them. Now, um, it depends on the child whether they're equivalent. Certain types of tonsils, like these big ones, uh, are ideal for a partial tonsillectomy, whereas these smaller ones, what we call endophytic, or I compare them to belly buttons, so sometimes they're innies and sometimes they're outies. Uh, the outies are great for the partial, the innies are probably better for a total. So, the, what we know is that there's a significant failure rate for tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy in managing children with sleep apnea. Um, and this is true for kids with more complex medical issues, irrespective of the technique. Um, again, a re recent review of a uh, large number of kids with uh, complex medical issues, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy. Uh, and we looked at those kids we treated with CPAP and surgery. And what we found was that tonsillectomy, again, is effective for some of them, but not consistently so, and there's a considered high complication rate, higher complication rate among these kids. So, what's interesting about tonsillectomy is that the modern tonsillectomy operation was really conceived in the beginning of the, uh, 19th, of the 20th century, and um, 
uh, we, n even back then, there was talk about, and this is from the same 1908 book, of expanding the operation to give more room for breathing. And um, for years, uh, the, uh, we saw in the adult world this operation called the uvulo, triple uvulo uh, palatopharyngoplasty uh, being done where they took off the, the uvula and uh, talk about hurt, a really painful operation. About half the time we got successful, the other time it was failure. And of course, you know, depending on if you were the surgeon or the, uh, or the sleep medicine doctor, which side you took on this issue. But either way, it was never took hold in the pediatric field. Um, what we have been doing in terms of expanding, doing something bigger for those kids we find potentially will fail, is what we call an expansion pharyngoplasty, where we use muscles of the throat to enlarge the airway. And this gives you some idea of what it looks like before with the tonsils in place. This is after the tonsillectomy, and this is after the expansion. So again, we get more room, and again, we've shown nicely that this works. Now, there are certain facial characteristics that uh, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Sun will talk about that we know routinely we fail with, um, and we're big fans of maxillary expansion. And we see maxillary expansion doing two things for us in, from the ENT point of view. Um, the maxilla, what they're talking about, this is your maxilla, this central core of your face. Expanding it, okay, pushing your, making the, the teeth go bigger, round. Well, the nose floats on the palate. So when you expand the maxilla, you wind the nose. You give more room for breathing, okay? That's number one. When you expand the lower jaw, you move more room for the tongue so it doesn't fall back as readily. So we're big fans of, of uh, orthodontics and every bit of extra room we can get, we're enthusiastic for. One other thing that's really important to talk about is don't forget the nose. We, call, we have this concept of the unified airway, okay? Um, all of you, pinch your noses, close your mouth, okay, and then sniff in hard. And think of, feel what you feel here, okay? Everything closes, okay? If your nose is plugged, your throat is gonna tend to collapse, okay? This is proximal, this is proximal, this is close to you, this is distal. If you have close obstruction here, it's going to likely collapse here because of your negative pressure you're generating because in your chest. Okay, so the nose is really important. We get lots of, uh, uh, we worry about turbinates. Those are these structures inside the nose that humidify and warm the air. We worry about allergies. We worry about sinus infections. And uh, we worry about when the, part, the partition between the two sides of the nose is deviated to one side or the other, or sometimes actually in the front it goes to one side and the back it goes to the uh, other, and then you're really in trouble. Anyway, so those are the things we look for to polish our results. Um, and we get lots of allergy testing and necessarily imaging uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, again, facilitate knowing what to do. And let me show you something here. This is, let me see, where's, where's my... Uh, these are the turbinates. Look at these. These are the structures inside the nose of the turbinates. This is looking at it if you were cutting the head like here, okay? On the other hand, these are the turbinates here if you're cutting the head going front to back, all right? You can see how much of the nose they take up, how much room in the nose they take up. So what we do there is we do turbinate cautery or we remove part of the turbinate, again, polishing our results. And these are some of the differences, what you can see in terms of the amount of room we can get, extra room we can get inside the nose. So uh, I've reviewed for you uh, the primary surgical options uh, when we do uh, for the bulk of these kids. Uh, we do partial tonsillectomy, total tonsillectomy, or expansion uh, if the, those are the issues that, or if the tonsils and the adenoids are enlarged and these are the sites where the obstruction is coming from. 
Now, let me tell you about my failures because they exist. Here's a seven-year-old child snoring in the daytime, fell asleep in my office. Um, we got a sleep study showed severe sleep apnea and very low oxygen. We went ahead, did a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, after which he continued to snore. He had less daytime tiredness, but he was still wetting his bed and he was doing much better in school. When we got a repeat sleep study, it was still severe. And his oxygen was better, but not above that 92% that I like the kids to live. So what do we do? Well, we can always do CPAP, okay? It's effective, it's safe, it involves a lot of parental involvement, but uh, it's a great alternative in difficult patient, but not all kids tolerate CPAP. And um, this has been the core of my work for the last decade. What do we do with the failures? What do we do when tonsils and adenoidectomy fail to help these kids? Is there a logical sequence for their evaluation? And are there rational options afterwards? So finding no real alternative what to do, uh, encouraged by the literature to, in the adult literature, about a process called sleep endoscopy, I'd like to share with you some of the lessons we've learned and the techniques that we've refined and now I'll tell you it's an important tool as part of our armamentarium. Uh, we use a small scope in conjunction uh, uh, with the monitor with the child asleep using a special drug cocktail. We involve the anesthesiologist as a real team effort um, and we use a special cocktail we developed uh, and what we're looking for is what I call my Legos classification for obstruction. We're looking at the voice box, at the flap of the voice box, the epiglottis, the tongue, glossus is tongue in Latin, the tonsils, the oropharynx, and uh, the soft palate for us. And this is what we're looking for. This is a normal first. Here we're coming into the airway from the nose, the child is lying on their back, you're looking at the soft palate on top, you're looking at the back of the throat on the bottom, and that's the epiglottis, and there's your voice box with the V going like this. Okay, and you're breathing, this is normal. And this child is asleep, and this is a normal breathing. This is big adenoids in the way. You can see that that child is having trouble breathing through the nose, that's completely obstructed. You can see the tonsils are enlarged as well. Here you'll see the problem seems to be where the uvula is in the way and doesn't want to lift up. And there's the voice box again and the epiglottis is that arch over the voice box. And here's tonsils completely in the way. And see how they're collapsing? This is your child breathing at night. Now here's an interesting one. This is a child with Down syndrome. We've done a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy on it. And you just watch because of hypotonia, the tube collapse. Collapse. We can't do anything for this child surgically. This has to be treated with CPAP. And then we see other parts collapsing. For example, notice the big bulky tissue here at the base of tongue. This is called the lingual tonsils and that's collapsing down onto the voice box. And this is the epiglottis collapsing. It's a long epiglottis anatomically a little bit unusual, and you can see it collapsing. And then finally, there's other causes as well inside the voice box where the voice box itself is collapsing inward. And I'll show you that in a moment, and that will be the end of the talk.
So sleep endoscopy makes a big difference and it's what we can do for your kids if uh, the other things have failed. Um, it doesn't always get us to where we want to go. One of the things I've learned as a sleep surgeon is humility. I can only do so much. Uh, some kids are easy to fix and you get a great result like we did with Joseph. Other times they, we can get, move the, the, the goalpost a little bit further back. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come address you. I think I've left some time maybe for a few questions. Um, be delighted to uh, uh, start. Any? Yes, ma'am. Please speak up. I'm hard of hearing. I've got my hearing aids in, but it's not the ideal. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Absolutely. Um, we know that sleep bedwetting, enuresis, that's the uh, technical term for it, is, is, can be associated with sleep apnea. And uh, we've known that, we've re officially recognized that uh, be, since about the mid 80s. Um, why it happens, we're not absolutely sure, of, but we do know that uh, during sleep we secrete antidiuretic hormone, ADH which cuts down on the amount of urine that we produce. Uh, fragmentation of sleep may interfere with that, increasing the amount of urine that is being produced, and uh, that may be part of it. It also may simply be neural control over because of the fragmentation of sleep. Uh, what I can tell you is that only about half of the kids that we see who have both bona fide sleep apnea and bedwetting, only about half of them will get rid of the bedwetting when treatment of the sleep apnea, when the sleep apnea is, uh, surgery is effective. Uh, and uh, I wish it were higher, but it's not. Thank you. Uh, does that answer your question, ma'am? So, with that said then, since there's, oh yes, ma'am. Let me, let me get closer to you. Will we have a QA after Question both. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. That would be great. Absolutely. Yes. So one question. So, since so many parts can affect uh, sleep quality and cause sleep apnea, is any particular <clears throat> position can optimize for the kids kind of not exactly at the severe level but already vulnerable to this condition? Any sleep position parents can help the children? You know, we all at some point in our lives have periods where we go and have sleep apnea, particularly when we're cold. Um, it's not a mortal illness, and it's not something that you need to really get all worked up about. Um, I think the child, like Joseph, has significant symptoms uh, where you're having problems with the child that clearly not sleeping well uh, for prolonged periods of time. You know, if he, he gets a cold, he doesn't sleep so good for a couple of weeks and then gets better, worry about that. That's not a big deal. But if it's ongoing, then the cumulative effect of that can be significant, both in the cardiovascular system, probably uh, behavior as well, and then I think it's worth pursuing. Thank you very much. So far, far, can we sit a little bit closer? It would be much. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a really a life story to learn for everybody. And it's, thank you, Dr. Patai, for your excellent presentation. But Dr. Patai is ear, nose, throat doctor, and his procedure 
is all focus inside of the me tube. So we're going to talk about we as an orthodontist, Dr. Sun Wu and I, we are orthodontists. We're basically, we're dentists. And I'd like to share with you how do we approach, how do we incorporate the airway into our daily practice. Traditionally, we just straight the teeth. People come to us, they want the teeth to be straight. Uh, it's kind of funny for us to talk about airway. Back to 70, Dr. Uh, Robert Ricketts and a few other orthodontists start to recognize how the facial development and the orthodontic work might tie together. And today, I'd like to start with a statement from a medical journal, the Journal of a Laryngoscope. That's a medical journal, that's not a dental journal. What they're saying is, the orthodontic, the orthodontic treatment should provide the fullness arch form and bring the upper and lower jaw as forward as possible. That's not from a dentist. That's not from a dental journal. That's from a medical journal. I think they really hit the nail on the head. <coughs> and let's see what the dental journals say about it. Last year, CDA Journal, California Dental Association Journal, they had an article. They talk about airway. They say the dentist must be familiar with anatomy of normal airway. It means there's something related to the dental as well. The significance of we as an orthodontist, we treat the airway problem. We don't work. We don't most of us, we don't do invasive procedure. We do it outside of the tube, the meat tube. We change the environment. So the tube dimension can be changed on their own. That's the way we approach. Because we orthodontists, we are not surgeon. We don't do any invasive procedure. So the first patient, uh, I'd like to call your attention. Some people, somebody might know about her, but I'm not going to, to say the name. She came to us, that's on the upper left corner. The dentist is going to have a four teeth pull on this patient in order to get uh, her teeth together. But I did nothing but just expand the upper jaw. That's on the upper right corner. After I did the expansion, can you tell the facial development has changed? I did not work on the chin directly. I'm not a surgeon. I just did an expansion. See what the literature say about it. So they're saying, there are a couple articles talk about if a kids can breathe better, they can grow better. That's the bottom line. And Dr. Katai just talked about it. If the kids can breathe better by expanding upper jaw. And we as a dentist, we love to do that. And let's go back to the anatomy. If we're young, the, our head is made by pieces of bone. The bone and bone, they are connected by the ligament, by the soft tissue. They're not really fused together. Get to the different age, once get to the young adulthood, 
or even younger, the bones start to fuse together. So you can see the anatomy. And the other slides, we'd like to present to you is, most of us, do you think that our jaw will get bigger? Yes or no? Let's take a survey. Do you think our jaw will grow bigger? When I say jaw, it means arch, or that part, does it get bigger by itself, by ourselves? Yes or no? Yes, no. Okay, according to the clinical study, there are several studies that's been done. The first one is from uh, Dr. Sang Wu's old school, Harvard, they did in the 60s. They, they have a smaller sample, they follow up, then they find out the size of the jaw doesn't grow with the age. And then recently, there's a bigger sample, 426 sample. They started for many years, from five years until 31 years old. They find out the size of the jaw doesn't grow with the age. So whatever you have is the size you're going to